As part of the derivation of the transverse shear equation we developed in the previous main video, linked below, we came up with an expression for the shearing force delta H that is created at a specific planar location of a beam subjected to bending. Finding the shearing stress is helpful when we need to compare it to the maximum allowable shearing stress of a material, like the material the beam is made of, or just like in some of the examples we covered, the glue that holds the components of the beam together. But when this shearing force is not causing an actual shearing stress, calculating the force alone can be helpful. In some cases, the shearing force on that specific plane is effectively resisted by what is holding the two geometries above and below that plane together, for example, nails or bolts. Just to quickly recall what we did then in that video, we looked at a beam of constant cross-section area that can have the neutral axis anywhere, not necessarily at the center, and we subjected it to random distributed loads and point loads. After taking a rectangular portion of the beam by performing two cuts along the x-axis and another one perpendicular to the y-axis, we analyzed the external forces that the rectangular portion was being subjected to. This horizontal reaction is what we are interested in in today's video, the shearing force delta H. For a refresher on first moments of area Q, make sure to check out the link to the two-minute excerpt of that transverse shear main video, found in the description below. If we take this delta H expression and we divide and multiply it by delta X, the length of the section of the beam we took out along the x-axis, we see that for a small delta X, delta M over delta X becomes dm dx, or what is the same, the derivative of the moment with respect to X, which is just the shear force V. A link to a one-minute video with the explanation of that relationship between moment and shear is linked in the description of this video. Therefore, the shearing force delta H is equal to VQ over I times delta X. Now, if for example this beam is formed by putting two planks of wood together, one thick and one thin, and they are kept together with the help of some nails, we could calculate the force in the plane of contact between the planks of wood by using the delta H equation. Since at that plane between the planks, all we see is the nails, the force delta H would be in its entirety affecting the nails. For the total force, delta X could be the length of the entire beam, and then each nail would be subjected to a fraction of delta H. Since delta H is the total force that all the nails are carrying, each nail would be subjected to delta H over the number of nails. However, this whole process is inefficient. If instead we define the magnitude of delta H as somewhat of a density, meaning the horizontal shear force you would get per unit length along the x-axis, we could more easily just measure the distance between nails and see that the sort of accumulated force between one nail and the next is equal to that shearing force density times the length between nails, which is much more efficient. This shear force density is what we define as shear flow, lowercase q the horizontal shear force per unit length. The reason I say sort of accumulated force is because as long as you don't have anything to counteract the shear force delta H, delta H keeps increasing. If we start at one end of the beam and move along the x-axis to a certain point, the delta H is the shear flow times that distance x. As we keep moving, delta H keeps increasing linearly until at some point we find a component, like the nail, that counteracts this force. Right after the nail, we go back to zero delta H and it starts increasing right away as we keep moving along the x-axis. Now all of this is just a visual explanation. We don't have any use for these delta H plots, so don't focus on these. As long as the nails or bolts are located equidistantly from each other, the way we use the shear flow concept is calculating the shear flow Q by calculating V, Q and I and multiplying it by the distance between nails or bolts to find the force that each nail or bolt is subjected to. Sometimes we have the maximum allowable shearing force information, like it is usually the case for nails, so we compare delta H to that maximum allowable value, and sometimes we have the maximum allowable shearing stress, like in the case of the bolts. In that case, since direct shear is shear force over area, we can multiply that maximum allowable shearing stress of the bolt times the circular cross-section area of its body to find the maximum allowable force, so that we can compare it to the delta H force of each nail or bolt. This shear flow concept is also helpful to calculate stresses in thin-walled members. 
Thin-walled members just refer to the cross-section areas of beams that are composed of thin sections, like for example an I-beam or a thin-walled square beam called a box beam. Since the shearing force delta H will arise from any cut we perform of any arbitrary shape out of any beam, whatever its cross-section area shape is, we can calculate the shearing stress caused by that delta H if we divide it by the area that that delta H is affecting. For example, for an I-beam, which does meet the requirements of what we call the thin-walled member, we can take out a small section of length delta X along the X-axis and then perform a vertical cut. Notice that this is unusual for us since up to this point we were used to performing horizontal cuts. However, just like in any other case so far, we can see the cross-section that delta H is affecting even if in this case it's a vertical cross-section area. This cross-section area can be calculated using delta X and the thickness T for that thin wall. The shearing stress delta H over area would yield an expression for an average shearing stress of VQ over IT. This is an identical expression for what we use to calculate the transfer shear stress caused by shear forces V that cause beams to bend. The only difference here is that the thickness T is not necessarily perpendicular to that shear force V, like it was mentioned in the transfer shear main video, link below to that section of that video. The name shear flow comes from the fact that we can draw almost flow vectors of shear, either forces or stresses, from where the shear is zero, increasing through the thin walls, to the point where the shear is maximum. For this I-beam example, you can easily see that if we perform a cut close to any of the corners, the first moment of area Q of the remaining area is practically zero, and therefore the stress is zero. If we perform a cut at the neutral axis, Q is largest, and since nothing else is changing, including T, we see that the shearing stress is maximum at that location. For a box beam, the cuts can also be horizontal, like we just did for the neutral axis of the I-beam, or they can be vertical, as long as we are actually removing a cut from the beam. This means that we cannot just make a cut like this, since we're not removing anything. Practical cuts would be those that have some symmetry so that we can calculate two stresses of equal magnitude to find the stresses in each section by dividing it by two. The closer we get to the center at the top with our cuts, the smaller Q is gonna be, and therefore we see that the shearing stress approaches zero there. Since the maximum shearing stress is found once again at the neutral axis, we would find the shear flow schematic with increasing vectors from the top center to the neutral axis. Worth pointing out here too is that even though a full vertical cut that actually removes a chunk is possible, it would not help us in calculating the shearing stress because mathematically, the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of the shaded area would be zero, which means Q would be zero and so would the stress. This is correct and consistent with what we have since in that case we would be adding two stresses of opposing magnitude together, right at the top and left at the bottom. Let's take a look at a quick example of shear flow for calculating shear forces in nails, and if you want to check out other examples, including shear forces, stresses in I-beams and box beams, make sure to check out the links to those examples in the description below. Three boards, each two inches thick, are nailed together to form a beam that is subjected to a vertical shear. If the allowable shearing force in each nail is 150 pounds, what is the allowable shear V? if the spacing S between the nails is 3 inches. Remember to try this problem on your own before watching the solution up next. The shearing force in each nail at the top is that accumulated delta H force that can be found by multiplying the shear flow value Q at the plane where the two planks meet times the distance that that force has been accumulated for, which is the distance between nails S. If that force cannot exceed 150 pounds, it means that V should not be greater than 150 I over QS. The second moment of area is found using the parallel axis theorem, link to that video if you need a refresher, and Q is the first moment of area for the shaded area, which can be the top or the bottom section at the plane for the shear flow. If we choose the top, Q is the area of the top rectangle times the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of that rectangle. Substituting all values, we find that the shear force should not be greater than 326 pounds. 
For all other shear flow examples, including shearing stresses of thin walled members, as well as the other lectures of the Mechanics of Materials course, make sure to check out the links in this video's description. Thanks for watching.